Well, thank you very much, Tom. And uh, <laughs> when you call somebody a defensive, defensive minded basketball player, what that really means is they can't shoot. Um, and I think the way my career would have been described is uh, he's not very big, but he's really slow. <laughs> but I certainly learned a thing or two about competition. And, um, and we've been involved, as I think all of you know, in a pretty interesting competition with respect to uh, GE over the course of the past few months. And, uh, and I do want to spend just a minute on that because I think there are some interesting elements to, the, to, the, to that particular scenario that, um, that are representative of a lot of the things we've tried to do since we took office uh, about a year ago. One, one of the biggest things I would point to is the collaborative spirit that I believe our administration has been able to bring to not just our relationships with our colleagues in, in state government, but also the relationship we have with our colleagues in local government. Uh, and maybe some of it had to do with the fact that uh, 20 days after we took office, it started to snow, and a lot of us thought it was never going to stop. But I did end up spending an enormous amount of time, and so did people on my team, talking to mayors and city managers and city councilors uh, all the way through that whole period. And I was probably on the phone once or twice a day with Boston Mayor Marty Walsh. Karen Polito and I had regular conference calls with uh, local officials and frankly with a lot of state officials all the way through that whole period trying to keep people updated on what was going on and it was frankly a lot of the feedback we were getting from local officials that led us after the second storm and before the third storm so for those of you who are keeping score that would be after five feet of snow had fallen and before four or five more were going to fall we started to hear from a lot of our colleagues in local government who were saying you know we've been pushing this stuff around for a couple of weeks now, and our intersections are dangerous. Uh, many of our sidewalks haven't been plowed. Nobody's gone to school for, a, for over a week, and we need dump trucks and backhoes and snow melters. We got to get rid of this stuff. We just have no place to put it anymore. You know, our snow farms are full. What, what is a snow farm? Um, so that was when we started calling some of the governors in other states, and over the course of uh, several days, we managed to get five states and two transit and transportation authorities to send us 200 pieces of equipment plus manpower, including the National Guard from Vermont and Maine. And we set up a staging area at Hanscom Air Force Base and we scrambled people out of there. And for the next three weeks or so, we literally had 150 projects going on with cities and towns around Massachusetts that was all about snow removal. Um, we also bought the only two snow melters that were for sale in the United States at that point in time. Um, yeah, we got a really great price on those. Um, <laughs> but we set them up in strategic locations, and they pretty much ran 24-7 for the next three or four weeks, and we were melting at one point about 100 tons of snow an hour. And, uh, and I think in many ways it was an opportunity for us both of us, Karen and I, as former members of our boards of selectmen in our hometown, to make clear to people that we were serious about wanting to build a collaborative working relationship with local government. And the amount of time and, and activity and the back and forth between uh, she and I and local officials and a lot of the folks on our staff, I think, laid a wonderful foundation on which we could build. And, uh, and as a result of that, you know, my chief of staff talks to Dan Coe, uh, Mayor Walsh's chief of staff several times a week. I talk to the mayor at least once a week, sometimes two or three times a week. Uh, there's a lot of back and forth on all kinds of issues where we have mutual concerns and interests. And people have told me on a number of occasions that he and I have, have done things that no one's ever seen a sitting governor and a sitting mayor of Boston do before, um, including the two of us testifying before the Mental Health and Substance Abuse Committee uh, back in November on the opioid legislation that our administration filed to enhance and improve the Commonwealth's education prevention, intervention, treatment, and recovery programs here in Massachusetts. And I'm quite hopeful that that legislation or a version of it is going to find its way back to my desk. The House passed a bill uh, yesterday. The Senate's passed one. They just need to get to conference and, and we can get going on that. But that became very apparent to the folks at General Electric when they were going through their review. Um, there wasn't an inch of daylight between 
the mayor and myself, or any of the people on our team, as GE was having these conversations with city and state officials around the country. And there were a ton of other reasons for why Massachusetts and Boston and the Seaport District were the right place for them, them to end up. And um, when you're the domestic leader in research and development and you have 55 colleges and universities in eastern Massachusetts and when you have um, incredibly terrific public schools uh, and you have a real ecosystem and so many different verticals that were of interest to them, we brought a lot, and you're five minutes from the airport, we brought a lot of stuff to the table that really mattered to them. But I certainly think that ability uh, for the mayor's team and our team to not behave as if we had just been introduced to each other and we're just getting to know each other, but to actually behave as a single unit as we engage GE in a conversation where they could have gone anywhere they wanted uh, and been welcomed with open arms and to end up being on the receiving end of that decision, I think is just a real tribute to the fact that we've really tried to focus on the work and not on the partisan nonsense that passes sometimes these days for political discourse in this country. And I think in many ways, thank you, and I think in many ways uh, that got noticed. Um, we couldn't be more excited to have a company like GE decide to come here. But the, the thing that makes this so impressive and important to me is this is a generational decision for them, okay? I mean, they've been in Connecticut for 40 years. Their decision to come to the Seaport District is not really what I would think of as a short-term decision or a transactional decision. It's a strategic decision. And it's a statement about what kind of organization they want to be, the types of people and the kinds of organizations they want to work with and be part of, the communities they want to embed themselves in, and what they think of what we have going on here. And I will be shocked and amazed if there aren't other companies um, all over the globe. We're gonna take a look at this and Boston and Massachusetts will end up back on their agenda if we weren't before or if we were, we'll get a second look because somebody with the, the reputation and the chops of a GE has made the decision to come here. Um, this is a really big deal for all of us and I think you know, time will tell and there's a ton of execution and follow through that has to happen here. But I think the potential of this to be a game changer in so many ways uh, for Massachusetts and for Boston is quite real. And I also believe that the possibilities with respect to product and, uh, and capability that they and we and the organizations that we have here can bring to so many different markets, products, and services is, is really, uh, really gonna be remarkable, and I can't wait to get started on that. Since you folks are in the real estate business, I thought what I might talk a little bit about, this is a real estate conference, right? Just checking. Um, I thought what I might talk a little bit about are some of the things that have to do with um, sort of our agenda and how I think some of them fit in with what you're up to. Um, we have talked a lot about the T because of all the reasons that came out of the, out of the winter last year, and I will say this, um, sometimes, um, sometimes a crisis like that creates a real opportunity. And I think in this particular case, working with the legislature, creating a fiscal and management control board to oversee the activities of the T, um, and getting some of the operational and, and administrative reforms that came with that legislation gives us, for the first time, uh, a very public, very transparent, and, uh, and very focused approach to what to do about the MBTA. And, you know, the <laughs> I hear all the time from people about, you know, well, there's all these stories coming out every week about this, that, or the other thing. Well, yeah, because a lot of this all took place for years and years and years behind the curtain and, and out of sight. And, uh, and when you create a fiscal and management control board and it meets in public every single Monday, and every single Monday, it's talking about the operational performance, the budget process, and the capital budget of the T. That's going to generate a lot of news. And a lot of that news uh, may be a little hard to hear. But that's exactly the kind of transparent process 
we should all want, and we should expect to participate in if we truly want to do the work that's associated with creating a better operation and a stronger T going forward. And for me, um, you know, people say, well, isn't that a double-edged sword? And my view is, look, I would much rather have a big public conversation about tough stuff and difficult decisions than continuous status quo where a whole bunch of stuff is going on behind the curtain that nobody knows anything about, uh, that, on, that you only see when it explodes all over us. And for me, uh, the T is not a short-term fix. Tom's absolutely right about that. It's going to take a long time uh, for us to get the stuff done that needs to get done there. But I do believe that the direction we are setting and the work that the Fiscal and Management Control Board is doing is the correct work. And, uh, and for the first time in a very long time, uh, the capital spending and the capital program that we put in place in this fiscal year is actually going to reduce the size of the state of good repair liability that exists at the MBTA. It's been 20 years that that thing's just gotten worse and worse every year. This is the first year where there's been enough focus and enough activity on what I would call the infrastructure of the operation that the size of that uh, liability is actually going to come down. Now, admittedly, we have a million miles to go on this, but you can't build a great system if you don't focus on it and you don't take a very aggressive approach to fixing the stuff that needs to get fixed. And whether you're talking about replacing all of the third rail on the orange and red line so that the third rail actually operates uh, when it starts to snow and the weather gets bad, um, or you're talking about creating um, the capability to actually continuously plow the tracks uh, during the course of the winter, which is something we couldn't do last year, but we will be able to do this year. Or you're talking about the process of actually starting to replace some of the signals and switches so that you can actually move more capacity through the system so that the system can actually serve more people. That may be boring and it may not be interesting and it may not be exciting and it's not shiny and sort of the next new cool bobble. There's a million people that depend on that system every single day to get to school, to get to work, to get home, to get to the grocery store, to get wherever they're going. And if we're not making the investments we should be making in the core system, the core system that people depend on and rely on, we're not going to get better. Now, I gave a, I gave a brief talk and I, um, I swore in the new mayor of Melrose the other day, and I did it in Memorial Hall. And there was a big plaque in the front of my Memorial Hall that talked about how it was uh, christened. It was built and christened in 1913. And I said, wow, that was a long time ago. And everybody said, yep. And I said, does anybody want to guess how old some of the signals are on the green line on the MBTA? And then there was this very uncomfortable silence, and, and I said, no, I really want you to guess. Come on, give me, give, throw some numbers out there. 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. And I said, you're not even close. Keep going. Um, and nobody got there, uh, because the answer is 105 years. Um, a lot of the signals were built uh, and installed in 1910. And we've been doing all sorts of fascinating and interesting things to keep them working ever since. But you think about it, I'm 59 years old, I get creaky when it gets cold out, all right? <laughs> but this is the sort of stuff we should be focusing on. And I can promise you that um, that Fiscal Management Control Board knows this, and that's going to be where a lot of their focus and a lot of their energy and their activity is going to be applied. Because the T is an incredibly important part of the lifeblood of Greater Boston. And it's an incredibly important element of why and how our real estate community, commercial, industrial, residential works, is able to generate the financing that's necessary to do the work that you do to provide the space and the capability that people need to live their lives, run their businesses, and go to work. Um, and that's going to be something that may or may not show up in the news a lot, but I can promise you, as long as the Fiscal and Management Control Board is there, you'll certainly hear a lot about what's going on. And it will be the kind of information that I think creates the kind of dialogue and discussion we need to have there. 
Now, I also am going to spend a fair amount of time over the course of the next year working on our energy strategy. And that's another kind of Borsnor topic, except that uh, because of a series of decisions that were all the right ones, that were made to take significant capacity in, uh, in coal and oil-fired um, baseload capacity out of our energy supply system and a couple of other significant systems that are closing, Yankee Row and Vermont and, uh, and Pilgrim, we're going to lose about 10,000 megawatts of power. And this is the 24-7, 365 stuff that powers the grid across the New England region over the course of the next five or six years. Now, the good news is we know this, so we actually have time to plan and do something about it. To the extent there's any bad news, it's that because it's five or six years away, it's sometimes hard to get people's attention with respect to what we need to actually do to deal with that lost capacity. Because a lot of the solutions that we can develop to deal with that will take five or six years to actually put into place. Now, my view in this is it's going to end up being a combo platter, as I call it. It's going to be some combination of um, hydro, uh, hydropower, wind, solar, and natural gas. But to make some of this happen, we need to, we need to engage and, and receive certain kinds of authorities from our legislature so that we can do some things on our own and do some other things in conjunction with the other New England states. Because this is obviously a big issue for them as well. And the opportunity here, if we play our cards right, is to end up with four, five, six years from now, a system that's going to provide us with the base load capacity, the 24-7, 365, continually there, reliable and adequate energy supply that we all need, that will be both financially predictable, cost competitive, and will continue the work that's been done to reduce our carbon footprint. There is a real win-win-win opportunity here, but it's one we're going to have to work pretty hard to make happen. And a lot of the folks who either reside residentially in the buildings that you folks manage and own and, de and develop, and the businesses that operate in those buildings need to understand that this one, this is one we can't wait two or three years to start to focus on. This is one where we need to make some big decisions and we need to make them in the next six months or so so that we can actually start doing the work with the other governors around the region and with the utilities around the region to solve for this major loss of energy capacity so that when we get out four or five years from now, we have done the work to position ourselves to successfully continue to compete and deliver the kind of capability that your customers, your clients, your tenants, and our families and businesses need to grow and to be successful here in Massachusetts. We're also going to do some work, and we, I've been talking to the mayor uh, of Boston and a number of other local officials as well, to see if we can't do a better job of leveraging a lot of state-owned property. Commonwealth of Mass is one of the largest landowners uh, in eastern Massachusetts, and it's probably the largest landowner in all of Massachusetts. And people call a lot of the land we own, and I'm not talking now about, you know, um, forest lands or parks or playgrounds or that kind of stuff. I'm literally talking about just parcels, for lack of a better word. I mean, a lot of them, I've looked at them. They have tall grass, beer cans, and a burnt out car or two on them. Um, people call those assets. I don't really know why. To me, an asset is something that actually produces something. And because a lot of this land is owned by DOT or the Mass, uh, or the mass, turnpike, or the mass turnpike or by um, the Executive Office of Public Safety or DCAM, um, or, uh, or the MBTA, a lot of it is located in pretty interesting places. 
And some of it's big pieces, some of it's small, some of it's um, clearly the kind of property you could do residential and mixed use type stuff on, and some of it is clearly much more commercial and industrial. But the Commonwealth has never been very good at actually creating a strategy, finding partners, working with local communities, and then executing on that strategy to put that land to work. We can do it once in a while when, you know, all the stars align and everybody gets lucky. But we would really like to think differently about this and work with a lot of our colleagues in local government, and those conversations have already started, to come up with what I would describe as a real strategic approach to putting that land to work. Now, I get the fact that even if we're strategic and aggressive and focused on this, it will probably take us a while to sort of get the flywheel running and the crank cranking, and, and there'll be all, other, all kinds of other elements um, that will get in the way of going as fast with this as some of us might like. But the simple truth is, if we don't do this, when somebody goes back and takes a look at this stuff four, five, six years from now, the same beer cans and the same cars are going to be sitting on that grass that were sitting on there when I looked at the property. And the buildings, in some cases, that are on those properties will be even worse shape than they were in when I looked at them. And they were in pretty bad shape to begin with. And this has the potential to unlock literally millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars over time of economic activity and to help us help local communities create vitality in places in their communities that may not have had quite the same level of economic activity that we've seen in other places. And I view this in some ways as sort of an under the radar and not very sexy not terribly interesting thing. But when I think about what we could actually do with some of this property and the results we could actually achieve with it, if we find the right partners and we do the right kind of work and we focus on it and stay on it and follow through on it, I know it can be important to a lot of our colleagues and local communities around Massachusetts. The one other thing I just thought I would mention to all of you, we are going to stay pretty aggressive about our fiscal discipline. You know, our budget last year started with a $1.8 billion deficit, which we met working with the legislature, we managed to whittle down. Um, and we still managed to fund uh, a fairly significant increase in local and education aid uh, and modest increases in higher education um, and a series of other initiatives around uh, the Department of Children and Families um, and transportation. But when people talk to me about, you know, governing philosophies and that type of thing. I'm a big believer that the more the Commonwealth can do to support local communities and live within our own means, the better off in the long run we are all going to be. I mean, a big part of the reason why GE started looking around was because they simply came to believe that every single year they were going to be dealing with a constantly changing tax environment. Um, in Connecticut. That's been written about, it's been talked about, it's been published over and over and over again. And I think a lot of the discipline that people have brought to the way they've governed the Commonwealth and the way um, we've operated as a state over the course of the past 20 years has had a lot to do with our ability to become truly competitive again when it comes to these types of corporate decisions. I also think the development of our innovation economy and the incredible relationships between our research and development organizations, our financial institutions, and our entrepreneurs, and our innovators, really has been game-changing and globally significant. And I don't want to do anything to screw that up. And when I think about the best things we can do as a commonwealth to continue to build on what's already happened, it's be physical be fiscally disciplined, be operationally smart and consistent, build strong relationships with local communities and local leaders so that they know what we think we can do, so that they can go do the things they need to do 
And think about it as one block, one neighborhood, one downtown, one community at a time, and just keep on running for as long as we possibly can. And that's over time how you create the kind of change that builds stronger communities, more productive communities, and a much greater sense of purpose and positivity for people about where their community is going and how they're going to get there. That is probably not the most rhetorically spectacular notion any of you have ever heard. But the flip side of that is government has a tendency, and I understand why, sometimes to overpromise and underdeliver. I'm really interested in the delivery part. Because more often than not, if we can become a, product, a predictable and dependable and reliable partner to those imaginers and big thinkers who are working with local communities and with us to try to do things and get stuff done, the likelihood of us being successful and those folks talking to other people and those folks talking to other people and other people, et cetera, is how you create the flywheel that I think is so fundamental to continuing the growth and success that we've all seen here in the Commonwealth over the course of the past decade. It's a great state. We're in the midst of a great run. And if we play our cards right, this run can go for quite a while. And we can create what I believe is a very strong set of communities from the East Coast all the way to the New York border so that everybody feels like they're part of a community that's heading in the right direction. With all the talent, all the brain power, all the capability we have in this state, there's no reason why we can't make that happen. But a big part of that is about building the right kinds of relationships, chasing the right kinds of stuff, and then staying on it day in and day out. And I can tell you this, that's the way we're going to think about this. And as far as the partisanship question is concerned, I had a very hard time finding somebody to be a Secretary of Transportation. And that was in large part because it's a really tough job. And I was looking for somebody who had both the aptitude to be able to deliver on a reform agenda and the attitude that said to me they were interested in that. And I was talking to somebody who said, you know, you should really you should really talk to Stephanie Pollack about this. And I said, Stephanie Pollack, um, she used to be like the chief operating officer at the Conservation Law Foundation. I think she sued me like 11 times when I worked in state government. <laughs> um, and, uh, and they said, yeah. And I, and I said, well, what's she doing now? And they said, she's over at the Dukakis Center for Planning and Urban Development at Northeastern. And I thought, OK, that's an, obviously will be coming almost everything from the same uh, point of view. That'll be interesting. So um, I called her up. She took the call. Good for her. And uh, she came in to see me. And about 30 minutes into the conversation, I realized that this was absolutely the right person for the job, like no question. We talked for about an hour and a half. And as we were walking back to the elevator, uh, I turned to her and I said, you know, if I offer you this job, my friends are going to kill me. And she looked at me and she said, and if I take this job, my friends are going to kill me. Um, <laughs> which kind of speaks to some extent to the way a lot of people think about public policy and politics and public life and to the way we're going to try and think about it. Campaigns are about competitions, I get that, but governing is about the work. And as my father once said to me one time, son, somebody sees two people fighting, they're pretty sure one of them is a jerk, they just don't know which one. <laughs> Words to live by. Thank you very much, hope you have a great conference.